Hey, it's fantastic to see you in church today. Bulla to our church family in Savu Savu and our condolences uh, to Pastor Jeff and Mita and their family as you mourn the loss of your father. Uh, so yes, wonderful to see you in church and actually in worship. How beautiful was worship today? Just incredible. The presence of God was, was here thick and I was just reminded of our love for you guys um, and... We love you so much, uh, but also I was reminded of the heart of the Father to his church, that he loves you more than we ever could, that when he sees you, raise your hands to him, lifting him up above everything else, that makes his heart glad. So be encouraged, you are beautiful, you are loved, you are seen. Thank you for being in the house and for tuning in online. All right, quick plug for last week's message. If you heard it, you know it was weighty and everybody in this place needs to hear it. If you weren't in church last week or if for some reason you missed it, please jump on Facebook or YouTube and get Joel's message in you. It, it needs to be heard by everybody in church. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story. The other day I did a naughty. Now, it's not that rare that I do a naughty, but I did this naughty and I'd been sick. I'd had a cold and... Things, things are different these days. When you've got even a sniffle or a sneeze, everybody goes, ah! So I had had a sniffle and a sneeze and a cough and a whole lot of cold things. And one of my children needed a birthday present for a party and there was time urgency. And so I went, all right, I'll have to go to the shop. So I went to the shops with the wake of a cold still all over me. I went to farmers at Tiawada Base, and I'm very familiar. How many ladies are very familiar with the base? We've got great shopping in Hamilton. So I went to the base, I went up the escalator, I bought the gift very quickly, and I went back down the escalator. And I don't think I realized just how sick I was, because when I got to the bottom of the escalator, I stopped and I looked around and I was so disoriented, I didn't even know where I was. I just went, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Oh, Lord, please don't let my face give away how I'm feeling right now. That would be embarrassing. So I waited, and somehow my brain caught up with my legs, and I was able to find the nearest exit and get out of there. I did a naughty thing, and I found myself disoriented. But seriously, have you ever found yourself asking questions like, am I heading in the right direction? Where am I? What if this mouse wheel, this super fast, super busy, super chaotic mouse wheel that I am running on at great pace is not the right one for me? What if I missed a turn somewhere? What if there was a sign that I didn't see and the direction that I am heading is not the right one at all? Have you ever found yourself disoriented? I have. And most of the time, we just, we just keep on running on that mouse wheel. We keep doing all the do's that we've committed to. We're faithful to them. We keep going. But there's some times where we just kind of take a moment and we stop and we take stock of where we are at in life and where we are headed moving forward. And as disciples of Jesus, I believe each one of us has a heart that just wants our lives to honor God where we live within his will, where hopefully one day he will say of us, this is my son or my daughter in whom I am well pleased. That's the desire of our heart. And today I believe God is wanting to speak to every single one of you. If you will listen, he will speak to your heart. I'm gonna share from a very special piece of scripture to me, but first I wanna pray, Lord, you are here. And we honor you. We set you at the highest place. You are the authority in this house. We lean in to hear from you. Would you speak to every person? Would you use my lips? Would you uh, speak to them what they need to hear today? I give you glory. I give you honor. And I give you praise for what you were about to do in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I remember a time as a young person, and I've had the privilege of always staying on what they call the straight and narrow. Through my teenage years, I pursued Jesus. And I remember in these teenage years when I was by myself, my parents were in Te Aroha and I was living in Tauranga. And I came across a situation that I didn't have an answer for. It was a specific situation. It wasn't this, but you know, it's kind of like, Lord, is it right to eat carbs? 
I couldn't find a specific answer to my specific situation. It wasn't as light as that. It was bigger than that. But what I needed was a specific answer to a specific problem. And as I turned through the pages of the Bible, all that I found was a very perplexed and frustrated me. See, I didn't find the specific answer for the specific problem that I was facing. And so I threw up my hands, not really, but in heart. I threw up my hands and I said, Lord, what do I do now? Where is the answer that I'm looking for? Would you show me what to do? And he responded by showing me that the answer I was looking for was actually right in front of me the whole time. I just hadn't seen it because it was so much more simple than I actually realized. He reminded me of a verse where Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. It's true. The answer I needed was right there in front of me. This was a piece of scripture that I had memorized. I had hidden it deep in my heart and yet this piece of scripture wasn't what I thought I needed. I thought I needed something that just had wisdom all over it and it looked a bit lofty and it looked very specific for my situation. I missed it. It was right in front of me. And here God did what I needed, which is to drop the mic on it. Boom. Here it is, Gil. This is what you need for this situation you find yourself. The answer I was looking for was simple. It was seek God first. Seek Him most. If in doubt, seek God. Seek the things of Him. Seek His Kingdom, And while I get busy doing that, God was saying, I'm going to sort that situation. I'm going to write that problem. I'm going to give you the answer that you're looking for. If you'll stop looking for the answer and look for the answer giver. So I've referred back to this moment many times and I know that I will again. This is one I'll never move past. I constantly need him to drop that mic on seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So to seek God first is what I believe God wants each one of us to do in this series on expansion, but also in our lives as Christians. This should be a constant for us. And I love the context of this scripture. It fits within Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. I actually want you to let this wash over you because it's beautiful, it's powerful. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the barns of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like was was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself so so true what beautiful words from Jesus Matthew 6 verses 33 is both a pivot away from worry and an invitation to us all to put God in the rightful place Jesus is saying that when we are in God's hands, we have no need of worry, which is great. Because in case you haven't noticed, worry literally changes nothing. 
Nothing at all. And yet we keep returning to it. I'll tell you what worry will do. It will add more wrinkles. It will shave years off your life. It will give you more grace, but it will not change your situation. What we give our focus, our time, and our priority to will actually direct the course of our lives. Play that out for worry. It's not taking you anywhere good. This verse tells us that nothing should have the priority like seeking God and the things of His kingdom. This verse simplifies the order of our lives. It suggests that rather than ordering our lives around all of the things or around the mouse wheel that we're running on or around getting ahead or just making it through, we should order our lives around Him. Now, Dr. Seuss is a favorite kids author of mine, and I'm aware that some of his texts may have been canceled. Most of his books really speak to me. But the other night, as I was earnestly crying out to God, Lord, you've got to give me something for your people, he reminded me of a Dr. Seuss book, and I love that God can use anything. Has anybody read On Beyond Zebra? Nobody. I wish I could read the whole book to you, but I can't. On Beyond Zebra is one that God has used previously to speak to me. And so I'm actually going to read you a few pages of this book. And then I'm going to explain why for those who think it's just messed up. I personally love the way he writes. Said Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell, my very young friend who is learning to spell, the A is for ape and the B is for bear. The C is for camel, the H is for here, the M is for mouse, and the R is for rat. I know all the 26 letters like that. Through to Z is for zebra, I know them all well, said Conrad, Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell. So now I know everything anyone knows, from beginning to end, from the start to the close, because Z is as far as the alphabet goes. Then he almost fell flat on his face on the floor when I picked up the chalk and drew one letter more. A letter he never had dreamed of before. And I said, you can stop if you want with a Z because most people stop with a Z, but not me. In the places I go, there are things that I see that I never could spell if I stopped with a Z. I'm telling you this because you're one of my friends. My alphabet starts where your alphabet is ends. My alphabet starts with this letter called Yuz. It's the letter I use to spell Yuzimataz. You'll be sort of surprised what there is to be found once you go beyond Z and start poking around. Halfway through reading that text, I realized I probably should be embarrassed, but I'm not. I still love it. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like God operates like the second child in that story. And while Dr. Seuss's writings are fictional, God's truths are far from it. And his wisdom makes our wisdom look like foolishness. We're like, hey God, I know this, I learned this, and I know that, and I have this plan, and people say these cool things about me, and look at this great life that I've built. Yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, cool, nice work, well done, you done? Want to see what I can do? You see, my alphabet starts where your alphabet ends. And he comes up with stuff that to our human thinking resembles yaz for yazimataz. I love him. As I was preparing this message, one of the things that God highlighted to me was this, that we as humans have a problem. Our dependency on self on our own ideas, on our wisdom and our understanding, on our ability to do this and to do that. This is self-reliance and it actually is a problem and it's not a new situation. See, it actually goes all the way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve, they've been placed in perfect paradise. They lived in a garden that had everything they could ever need They daily walked with God. There was this intimacy. They had provision of everything they needed. They did not have to work. They didn't have to toil. There was no strife. There was no pain. It was beautiful. It was perfect. God placed them. He gave them rule over everything. And he even gave them naming rights 
to the animals. They got to name the animals with God himself, even though they had no part in making them. This was a privileged existence. They lived free and they were given just one rule. Genesis 2 verse 16 to 17 says this, And the Lord God commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We have had as humanity a long-standing issue with this desire to be self-reliant, autonomous from God. Adam and Eve lived in perfection. There was no shortage of food. They had everything they needed. They had a better life than we could even possibly imagine. Incredible. And then Satan comes along in the form of a snake. He maligns the character and nature of God. He undermines Eve's absolutes. He, he goes, hey, surely you wouldn't really die. Surely you'd just gain the wisdom that God has and you'd become like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat of the fruit. He convinced her that this fruit was desirable and that she would not die but obtain wisdom and be like God if she ate it. Genesis 2 verse 9, I've got something I'm trying to say here. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This verse makes it very clear that there was no shortage of food, of trees that had appealing fruit. She was not in lack. She was not in need. She did not have hunger pangs running through her body. That was not in short supply. The difference with this tree was that there was an offering of wisdom and knowledge beyond what had been given to her and the ability to rule separate to God. Humanity has a problem and so do we. Our tendency towards being self-reliant, where everything depends on us, where we need to know all the things and sort all the things is actually not that unfamiliar to what Adam and Eve went after in the garden. It's good to learn. It's good to work hard. We need to steward what we've been given well. That is good. But these are not supposed to be our first pursuit. Our first pursuit needs to be God, seeking Him, seeking the things of His kingdom, seeking His kingdom advancement. And when we do this, things are in their proper order with God being God and us being under Him. I would suggest to you that seeking God first is a kind of antidote to our human problem. See, our desire to rule alone, to be, we're supposed to be Christ-like, but the desire to be God-like, where we are the authority, where we have the answers, where we are the ruler, that's not okay. It means we live as though it all depends on us, and this actually gives us much reason to worry, because man, if it all depends on me, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> I don't know about you. But if we truly surrender to seeking God first, we get to quit striving and driving and instead find the freedom that comes with our focus is seeking Him. All the stuff, He's got that. He'll sort it out. And you might say this, so the call is to seek God first, but what about all the things? I can't just ignore them. I got stuff in my life. Yep, so do I. Before I go further, I want to point out to you what Jesus says earlier. In Matthew 6, verses 7 to 8, he says this. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. Catch this. For your father knows exactly what you need before you ask him. Does he know about your things? Does he know about your problems, your questions, the things that get you down and bear you down? Yes, he does. He knows it all. We can take comfort from that. The things that would cause us to worry, the needs that we have, the health issues, the relationship issues, the financial issues, yep. He sees those. 
He knows them. So what does all that I'm saying have to do with our vision series, Expand Church? I believe it has a lot to do with Expand Church. See, I believe that God wants the balance of things to be clearly tipped in favour of Him being the Lord, not us. Where He is the solver. He is the answer. He is the point of refuge. He is the anchor. He is the reason. He is the provider. He is the wise guy. And we are not. See, when Adam and Eve took matters into their own hands, they went from perfection with right relationship, man to God, and all their needs being met, to being exiled from their perfect garden paradise and losing everything. What they gained instead was separation from God, pain and childbirth, a life of toil, at the end of which they would ultimately die. Who wore the God hat better? God wears the God hat better. It's the right way for things to be. God is meant to be God and we are not. And that's, if, if you are sitting here today and you're going, man, I, I totally live like that. This is not a message to make you feel bad. This is a message to stop you carrying on like that. And it's a message that I believe we all need to hear. See, God is saying that the problem or worry that has been consuming you doesn't have to do so anymore. He's releasing you from the burden of having to know all the things or being able to sort all the problems or plan every next step for the foreseeable future. You can if you want. You can carry on doing it all yourself, worrying about all the things, or you can experience the release that comes as you hand it over to Him. Go, Lord, I'm going to seek you first. You're my number one. You're my first priority. You're the one I'm going to seek most. And watch as he does what only he can. And he sorts the things, not just enough, but in a way that says, hey, this was me. This is God. This is my favor. This is my protection. This is my provision. Let me ask you this. What if the answer or the breakthrough, or the next step that you are looking for is tied to your willingness to leave the comfort of what you know in favor of stepping out into the unknown where God knows your next step, where he knows where the provision's gonna come from, where he knows where, how the miracle's gonna happen because he's gonna do it. I believe some of us are wondering why we aren't seeing God's power at work in our lives today. Or maybe there's just a hunger in us, there's an appetite to see more of his power on display. I want you to catch this. And we were singing this earlier. God is powerful. He's still powerful today. He is still working today. He is moving. He is still doing miracles. He is still changing lives. God is still powerful today. The lack of evidence of God's power in our lives is not the evidence that God is not powerful. It could be, however, that the lack of evidence of God's power in our lives is because instead we are unknowingly, we have chosen to remain within the safety of our own understanding and our own abilities. Do you know, within the safety or the confines of what we know and what we can do, God doesn't need to move. We don't need faith to step into something we know we know and we know we can do. We need faith to step into something that only God can do. Consider when Jesus told Simon to take his boat into the deep and lay down those nets. Remember, he'd spent all night fishing. He was a seasoned professional, and yet he had caught nothing. And Jesus goes to tired, weary Simon, and he goes, go out into the deep and fish again. The confines of his mind, they would have said, don't do it. That's it's foolish. Don't do the same thing again and think that in daylight, which is not the right time to fish, you're going to get a catch of fish. If he stayed within the confines of what he knew, he would have said no. But we know that he responded in obedience. 
We know that as individuals and a collective church family, God is calling us to expand. If you haven't caught that yet, then I pray that by the end of this message you do because we want no church family left behind. We're on a journey together. In Acts 2, we see an amazing example, and it's one that we've gone over and over. We're familiar with this. We see an amazing example of expansion when the church was birthed by God's power, moving by His Spirit. This didn't happen just because. It wasn't just an event that came out of nowhere. What preceded the expansion, the, the beginning and expansion of the church was crazy, reckless, faith-filled obedience. Remember, Jesus had already died. He'd already been raised to life and over a period of 40 days, he'd been appearing to people, speaking of God's kingdom. During this time in Acts 1 to 4, he'd given the apostles this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What came before the birthing and expansion of the church was the apostles' obedience to do as Jesus had commanded them. These were still people. These people had stuff going on in their lives that they had to lay aside to be in a room waiting for this helper that would be sent without any knowledge of how long they would wait. They probably didn't always get on all the time. I don't know. Imagine being stuck in a room with people for what ended up being 10 days. These were people. They had to lay aside their stuff in order to be obedient to what Jesus had said. We know the result was that the Holy Spirit poured out, bringing awe. Peter got up, he preaches the message of his life. 3,000 or more actually were added to the church that day. This was miraculous. This was God evidencing. But it didn't just happen. It started with faith-filled, crazy, audacious obedience. Catch this. If we live within what we can achieve, we don't need faith at all. We don't need God for what we can do alone. If you want the power of God on display and you're just living within the comfort and parameters of what you know and what you can do, don't be surprised that He's not moving in power. You don't need Him. You can do it. You've got this, that self-reliance. But faith is the currency of heaven. Faith in God is what catalysts Him moving in power in our lives. I'm hungry for it. How about you? I want more of His power on display in my life. I really want you to get this. See, if you look at your life, are you living a life where you know your next move and the one after that? And the one after that, because you've planned it all out. You know that it's all possible because you've calculated it out to the nth degree. You know you got this. You know you can do it or you wouldn't even move into that direction. I believe God is calling us to move forward with the kind of faith and obedience where in order for what we're believing for can happen, it has to be God who comes through. That's where He's calling us to live. It's time to go on beyond zebra. God's alphabet begins where your alphabet ends. Next week, we take a faith leap and I encourage each person who calls Hope Chapel home to go to faith in advance, to seek God, to see God, yes, for a number, what should you sow? Absolutely. But to surrender afresh and go, hey, God, I commit my life afresh to you. You are my first pursuit. I lay aside the stuff. And as I surrender, and it's going to be a moment of surrender and giving next week. As I surrender my finances in a way that costs me, in a way that causes me to go to faith. I trust that you are 
You wear the Godhead better. You are the better provider. You know, there's some people who you're believing for fresh vision. You found yourself stuck. You found yourself spinning relentlessly. You're fatigued. You're just on that mouse wheel of life and you're going, Lord, help. I don't know where to go next, but I know that this is not, this is not my forever. It could be that as you seek Him, He's going to give you fresh vision, fresh vision. But often it takes faith-filled obedience. It takes some surrender on our part before that's unlocked. Encourage you, seek Him this week. Do it in your own time. When we were on the journey considering coming here to pastor, there were many God moments. And for me personally, there were moments where I was all in and moments where I went, please, Lord, don't make us do it. And I don't know where I was at, but I remember physically where I was at. I was under our house. We had an old house that we transported to to Tauranga. And I was under this house in the muck with cobwebs all over me. And I was done. I'd installed a lot of Expol, which is what I was doing. Polystyrene, it's gross. And I was like, Lord, you've got to give us clarity in my head. Because otherwise it would have been crazy. (laughs) Probably would have said it anyway. And, it, and, and a song came on and it said, release me, enlarge my territory. And for me, that was a moment that tipped me over. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Because sometimes saying yes, when He says, release me, trust me, go again. Sometimes there's pain because we've done it before and it doesn't always go well every time. For me, it was a moment of surrender. Okay, Lord, I'll release you. I'll trust where you're taking us on this journey. I believe he's saying that to some people today. Release me. Enlarge my territory. Take the limitations off. I could put it this way, Isaiah 54, 1. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. This passage is preparing a people for increase that is coming while they cannot yet see it. Okay, we can see a measure of increase, but God is saying, prepare for the increase that is coming while you can't see how we can possibly accommodate. Enlarge my territory. This is one of those kingdom logic things where we've got to surrender first before He does what He's going to do. I'm excited and I'm expectant because for us personally, every year, Joel and I take opportunity on the Miracle Offering Sundays and we go to faith. We're not looking at all the things. We're asking God, all right, Lord, what would you have us give? And we're experiencing downloads often of what He's also taking us into. It's both for us every year. So we give in a way that stretches our faith and we tie our hearts to the house afresh. And every single year, COVID, economy stuff, all the things, God has been faithful for us. He has never left us wanting. And every year He says, go a little bit more. But I can testify that it's a miracle in our lives every time that we give. I encourage you, if it's, if it's a crazy radical thing for you to step out in faith in a financial offering, go to God, process it with Him and allow Him to speak to you about what your stretch should be and also what you're believing for moving forward. Natural wisdom would say a house is built when we build it. Just like the alphabet says A is for ape all the way up to Z is for zebra. But God's wisdom says that if we seek Him and His kingdom first, He will build our house. This might sound to our brains kind of like yazas for yazamataz did to the child in the story. See, our logic doesn't understand God's ways, but I can say this, God is faithful. He will honour His Word. We can go with what we know where we set our course according to our ability and our knowledge 
And the result will be a result that we could have predicted because it's planned, it's passed, we know what would happen. But if we go with what we know and we reside within our own ability and our own understanding, it will not cause the hand of God to move in our lives. I believe God is inviting us to go another way where we commit to seeking Him first, to building His kingdom, to making Him the number one, the first, the most, going to faith and relentlessly again and again, handing over our confidence, our trust, our reliance to Him. I'd love you to stand to your feet. There's a couple of things I wanna do in this moment. The first one is that I'm very aware that not everybody in this room may have even said yes to Jesus. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness actually begins with saying, Yes, Jesus, I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior. That's the beginning. And actually, if there's people in this room who you haven't yet said yes to Jesus, then I wanna give an opportunity for you right now in this moment to quickly pop up your hand and invite Him in as your Lord, as your Savior. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, I wanna quickly ask you, if that's you today and you wanna say yes to Jesus, I wanna see a, a hand in the air and I wanna pray with you. Thank you, I see that hand. You can pop it down. Is there anybody else you wanna say yes? Maybe it's for the first time. Thank you, I see that hand. Maybe it's for the first time and you've never said yes to Jesus or maybe you've said yes to Jesus at one stage, but if you died tonight, you don't know where you'd go. If you wanna, if you wanna rededicate your life to Jesus right now, I wanna invite you, quickly pop your hand up and we're gonna pray. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody. Thank you, I see that hand. I see that hand. Wonderful, anybody else? Anybody else, if you're online, feel free to DM me afterwards. All right, we're gonna pray all together. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. I accept your forgiveness. I'm sorry for all the wrong things I've done. I invite you in as my Lord and Saviour. Holy Spirit, fill me now. Amen. Can we give a clap? That's phenomenal. And what you're hearing in this room is a small sound compared to what's happening in heaven right now. Well done. Hey, the other thing I wanna do is I wanna pray over you as a church because I believe what needs to happen from here is not in this place, it is in your place. It is as you travel about your week, you need to seek God. And I wanna pray for you before you do that. Father, I lift up this church, Fano. I thank you that you love them more than we ever could. I thank you that you are the head of this house and you are taking us on a journey together. And Father, I pray that as we commit afresh as your church to seek you first, no matter what, help us, help us, Lord. The things are noisy, the tendency to rely on me and mine, it, it's, it's strong. Would you help us daily to seek you, to seek you, to seek you. And Father, as we head into what will be a miraculous weekend next weekend, I pray that every person would hear from you, that it would be twofold. That yes, it would be a number. It would be something, Lord, where you call them to stretch and go to faith, that they know that that's you. But I pray too that you would begin to download promises, declarations, uh, prophetic pictures, Lord, of, of what it is that you are bringing into their world. And Lord, I pray, God, that as we commit to seeking you first, there would be within each one of us a peace to know that all the things are better in your hands. You know about them and you are working things out. We honour you. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what a, what a powerful message. And 
really it's one of priorities, right? And it's not an easy message to preach uh, because it's counterculture. Uh, it's counter everything that we've been raised to believe and think about ourselves is to, to figure it out and do it on our own. But God's calling something different to live counterculture and to put our priorities on Him, on His house, and to trust Him with everything else. So why don't we give Sarah a huge round of applause. That was outstanding. Um, as always, the, the altar's open for prayer afterwards. I know that's challenging. Maybe your life has been out of whack and you do want to reprioritize on seeking Him first and you want someone to stand with you and pray through that with you. It would be an honor for us to do that. We have team available. Uh, and if you did say yes to Jesus for the first time or recommitted your life, we'd love to connect with you afterwards as well. If you don't have a Bible, we can give one of those to you. But it would be an honor to pray with you as well. Otherwise, have an outstanding day. Hang around, take someone for lunch, go to the cafe and hang out and we'd love to connect with you. If you're visiting, please make yourself known to us. We'd love to connect with you as well. Thanks for joining us online on YouTube and Facebook. Have a great day. Have a great Sunday, everyone. And we will see you next week for our spring carnival. Can't wait for that. God bless.